Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, forever. Amen. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In us and through us, Lord, let us be a taste of heaven to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for the least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you were cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or ill or in prison and did not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of the least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. One of the world's leading media outlets did research on how Jesus may have looked by studying the skeletal remains of males in that part of the world dating back to the time of his life. And it was determined by the report that I saw on TV one day that he was probably five foot four inches tall and he looked something like this. Scriptures do not tell us how he looked, it just says he's not very attractive. In fact, uh, it could be an argument could be made. He's the kind of person that people wouldn't want to look at. I think the point from the passage we just heard read to us with photographs is that this is what he wants us to identify with when we think of how he looks. We see him in the face of the foreigner, the stranger, the refugee, the legal immigrant and the illegal immigrant, the child, the prisoner, the ex-in-law, the orphan, the widow, the widower, the young, the old, the elderly, the infant, because he identifies with us. In our text today, it said, on Judgment Day, he will separate sheep from goats. And to the sheep, he will say, that I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And because of this, he had preceded that statement with these words, Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then the righteous, that is the sheep, will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you in need? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick 
or in prison and come visit you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The word there, my brethren, is actually referring to the least of these. One translation says, the, ye, the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. He so identifies with the needy in the world, he calls them his brothers and sisters. It's my desire today, as any Sunday, to comfort those who are in distress. But this is a word that will distress those who are comfortable. We're talking about how to live in light of Judgment Day. Can we say that? Thank you for asking. His words drew lines. The word of God is a sword sharper than any two-edged sword. It's like a sword dividing things. Truth from error. Eternal truth from temporary lies. Evil from goodness. And in our text today, we see this, him dividing sheep from goats on judgment day. He is the king that he's talking about. Prior to this text, he told three parables. The parable of the faithful servant and the evil servant, whose master commissioned them authority in his house, and in his absence, the faithful servant was faithful to take care of his master's household. The unfaithful servant, not knowing when he was going to return, abused his authority. And so when the master did return, there was punishment. And he told that parable to tell them to be ready because you do not know when your master is going to return. Then he tells the parable of the virgins, the wise and the foolish virgins. I like to say um, the bridesmaids because this had to do with a, a bridal party. No one wants a bridesmaid in their wedding with a bad reputation that would distract from the beauty of the bride, right? Oh, you want to heard about her? No, it's all about the bride. So in this bridal party are bridesmaids. Five are wise and five are foolish. None of them know when the wedding's going to begin. The invitation didn't say, you just have to be ready. And of course, when the wedding day came, the bridesmaids that were wise were prepared. Those that weren't wise had to go to the store to buy more oil, and they missed out on the whole thing. And Christ compared that to his return, to the need to be ready. It's great to be a virgin bridesmaid. It's wonderful, but it's even more wonderful to be ready. Then he tells the parable of the talents of the faithful servants who took what was entrusted to them and invested it and prospered and, and the unfaithful one who took what was invested in him and buried it. And when the master came, they didn't know he was, when he was going to come. There was a day of reckoning. The faithful were rewarded and the unfaithful was punished. In these parables, Christ's words divided, divided lines, drew lines between Faithful and unfaithful servants, wise and foolish bridesmaids, good and wicked stewards. And having told these parables, he then speaks clearly of a day that is coming. Mark my word, this is not a parable. He said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. He'll set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. Of course, the sheep are rewarded, the goats are not. The difference in goats and sheep is sheep are more easily led than goats. Goats, you kind of have to drive. Goats have a mind of their own. If you want to see funny pictures, just do an image search on goats. You'll see them doing all kinds of crazy things. They are rebellious. They're always budding. Today we're talking about how to live in light of Judgment Day. The fact Christ told these parables and the need to be ready for His return and, and be wise with, with the stewardship He's entrusted to us. And then He goes into what's going to happen on Judgment Day. He is really emphasizing this. This 
story that he shares, of this prophecy that he shares, follows up on his prophecies in Matthew 24. When he was asked three questions, when will these things be? He had predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. What will be the sign of your coming? He had also predicted he would come back one day. And, and of the end. And I believe he tried to answer all three questions there in Matthew 24. And I believe part of those prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD. Jerusalem was destroyed. Some people say he came back in 70 AD. I looked around the world, I don't think Christ came back yet. And I don't think the end of the world has happened yet. We're still here, right? So these prophecies still are yet to come to pass. Then he tells the parable of the fig tree. He says, when you see these things come to pass, know that the end is near. And he's told, told about a fig tree. When it begins to bud and blossom and bear fruit, you know the time of harvest is coming. So it is when you see these things I'm talking about come to pass, get ready. So my point today is get ready. Look at what's happening. The Lord's coming is But then he balanced that by saying, no one knows the day or the hour. There's something about getting ready that purifies us. Which brings us to our first point in living in light of Judgment Day is remembering why he refines. He's coming after a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's coming after a pure people, right? I think the big point today is uh, being warned about the dangers of the sins of omission more than the sins of commission. But we have to deal with the sins of commission, those things we do that are wrong. Sin takes us further than we wanted to go. It keeps us longer than we wanted to stay, and it costs us more than we wanted to pay. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sins of commission are serious, but we learn not to do them. You suffer consequences for committing sins of commission. You know that? There's consequences. It can destroy your relationships. It can destroy your career. It can destroy your ministry. It can take you back to square one with people that love you the most. Sin does that. And after a while, you start learning. You know, like a kid gets tired of falling down, he starts learning how to walk. So it is, as we grow in Christ, we stop doing the same things we used to do. Because sin and commission have consequences. The Lord chastens those whom he loves. And he uses the law of reaping and sowing to chasten us, to make us more like himself. But my concern today is the sin of omission is more subtle than that. We'll come back to that. Remember, in light of Judgment Day, we need to remember when he returns. He's going to return. We're supposed to be ready. Any day, we're supposed to be ready. This hope refines us. If we knew he was coming back tomorrow, we would be ready, right? But if you knew he was coming back 10 years from now, would you be ready? Not so serious, right? The Lord wants us to be serious about our walk with him at all times. Not like these people. The Bible guarantees Judgment Day, May 21st, 2011, familyradio.com. That was an embarrassment, wasn't it? I hope those people that charge their credit cards up for getting themselves out of the debt they ran up by believing something that wasn't true. The Lord wasn't saying that. In fact, he said no one knows the day or the hour. Yet he emphasized the need to be ready. Is he contradicting himself? No, he's just sharing a paradox. You don't know the day or the hour when the Lord's coming. Somebody tells you they know, they're just wrong. Well, he has to come back during tabernacles. Well, he does. You don't know which one, though, <laughs> if that's true. They were wrong about his first coming. Trust me, everybody's wrong about his second coming. We don't know when it's going to be. He himself said that. So don't be duped by these people. I bet you can get a copy of 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988 Real Cheap. <laughs> How to Live in Light of Judgment Day. Remember what he rewards. He rewards faithfulness. He rewards wisdom. He rewards goodness. He rewards sheep. He rewards people that love their fellow man like they love Jesus. 
Remember whom he regards. The Lord so identifies with the needs of hurting people that he has regard for them to the point that if we do something about someone's need, he takes it personally. Who has children? Who has regard for their children? If someone mistreats your child, you take it personally? <coughs> oh yeah, you slap me around, but don't slap my baby. <laughs> How we treat our fellow man, the Lord takes it personally. He calls in his brothers and sisters. He has regard for them. Remember where he reaches. Where does he reach? Not just in the church house. He reaches out there in the four corners of the earth, outside the four walls, the south, east, and west. He reaches to the guttermost for the uttermost sin to save it. He reaches us. And he uses us who sincerely pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is is in heaven, he uses us to work the will of heaven wherever we get the opportunity. And we need to remember how he recruits. Through the foolishness of preaching, he calls us to repentance. This is not an easy message to prepare, <laughs> filled with doubts, convicted my own self, but I believe this is the word of God for us. He calls us beyond the sins, not sinning sins of commission, to not sinning sins of omission, to jump at the chance to serve our fellow man. How to live in light of Judgment Day? Answer this question. Are you ready? Are you faithful? And are you serving? Those we serve will be blessed. And when we bless others, guess what? It's a law. We're going to be blessed. The bridge you build for someone else, you may go on one day. The lift you install in your church, you may ride on one day. The roof you repair may be on a house you live in one day. Over Christmas, my dad told me a story I didn't know when I was a kid. He pastored in Bloomington, Illinois, and his parents, my grandparents, lived in Creve Court, Illinois a suburb of Peoria, about 36 miles away from our house of theirs. And one cold winter snowy night, he couldn't sleep. So he got up after midnight and says, I, I got to go to Peoria, I don't know why. And he got on Interstate 74 and began to drive. And I'm not sure where he was at on the route between Bloomington, Illinois and Peoria, but he saw two headlights just out of the corner of his eye down a ditch. He was able to pull off the road and help those dear people, and you'll never guess who they were. His parents. <laughs> Grandma was crying, we're going to freeze to death. Now what if he had delayed his obedience, and I'm going to wait till it's warmer after the sun rises. Were they froze to death? I'm not sure. Grandma exaggerated a lot. <laughs> they may have. Let me ask you a question. Is delayed obedience obedience or is it actually disobedience? It's disobedience until you obey and sometimes that time passes. If we want the kingdom of God to come to earth like it is in heaven, are we willing to do our part to see that come to pass? My concern for us is, as believers, as Americans, our lives get so full in our 24-7 culture, there's no margins in our schedules to do anything for anybody else. Because our family really is our priority. And we do need rest, and, and uh, you know, we do have our career and ministry, but, but what about the vagabond? Who's going to make room for him? On Judgment Day, we can't say, Lord, I was just too busy, or, or Lord, it's the Democrats or the Republicans, or, or Lord, it was the economy, or Lord, it was my bills. Every debt we make, we need to pray about it first, because debts can rob you of time. Moral, we're servant to the lender. we got to pay our bills, otherwise we're stealing, right? And so, may the Lord use this word to purify us in such a way that we create some margins. I mean, you can be extreme 
and say, okay, I'm going to give God eight hours a month and I'm just going to drive the interstate looking for people to help. If God leads you to do that, fine. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying make some room where you can respond to the voice of the Spirit when you see something in me. Well, how do I know if God's talking? God is love, right? And when you approach a scenario of need, what would love tell you to do? That's God. It's not rocket science. Well, I thought God came to your house and had coffee at night. <laughs> People that do that, that's great. Bless them. Hallelujah. But I'm sorry, I'm just more practical than that. What does love tell you to do? Do it. Let love meet its destination. That is God's. On Judgment Day, you can't say, well, why couldn't somebody else did it? Well, I wasn't a preacher, I wasn't a missionary. <laughs> Lord will separate sheep from goats on judgment day. He just will. Now we can rest back on our blessed assurance and say, well, I have eternal security, but how is that pleasing to the Lord? And how is that being ready for his return? That makes a mockery of the whole of Scripture by cherry picking certain verses to lean on and neglecting the whole message of the New Testament. It's about the kingdom of God coming to earth and us doing our part to express that. The kingdom is here and yet it is coming to us. We're living between the now and the not yet. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, I ask you to speak to our hearts in such a way. What are you calling us to do? To do our part in our communities where we live. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray especially for that person that has done some extreme things to help people and things blew up in their face or it didn't last or they got burned or whatever. Help them to know, Lord, that one day they're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, but why did you stop? Let us be faithful to do your will. In spite of what others do, Lord, let us not compare ourselves to others. In Jesus' name. Give us hearts to hear that you love us and that we are to help other people hear that and see that. In Jesus' name, amen. This is kind of a heavy word, but it, 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 it can be a joyful word. You ever help somebody and then there's just a joy in your heart that comes? It's like, like that Scottish guy in the Olympics in the movies Chariots of Fire, when I run, I feel his pleasure. You feel the pleasure of God because you... You help somebody. Reminds me of the Bob Dylan song. You gotta serve somebody. You might like to drink whiskey, you might like to drink milk, you might like to wear cotton, you might like to wear silk. But when it's all said and done, you gotta serve somebody. And serving others can be fun. I'm about to show you a fun slideshow. Featuring the ministry of Granberry reach out. Alan Ginchel and his mother, Donna Bursey, go to church here in the early service. And they have this ministry that goes out on Saturday mornings between 9 and noon, in the summertime between 8 and 11, helping people repair their homes. If you own your own home and your home needs repair and it's dangerous, contact them. Your information is out here at our information desk, as well as if you'd like to get a weekly email from them as to what they're going to do that week, so that you can get involved from time to time as your schedule allows, as the Lord shows you where a margin is. By all means, sign up to get on that email list. Check this out. Today the grass is
generaciones, muchas gracias por el, las bendiciones que nos han dado y gracias por todo y que Dios los colme de bendiciones. We we'd like to thank the the ministry of Reach Out from Granberry. Yes. They they're the ones that came and put this up for me and I really appreciate it. And we're just thankful to the Lord for all that he's done sending that ministry here to keep them in prayer yes. and keep lifting them yes. up that the Lord will keep blessing them. Yes. And just keep the, his hands on.